So let's get started. Um, as you may see on the middle screen here, we made Fox News. Whether this is such a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave that up to you. Um, yeah, there is a quote from me later on um, down in this article. So, <clears throat> well, avoid that for the rest of class today. A uh, couple of things. What's happening next Wednesday? Midterm. A few people have asked me about the midterm and have been looking at practice exams, and they've not been happy about what they've been seeing on practice exams. So, um, I pulled up this scores from the second midterm from last year. And actually, the high score here, 46, I think, is the highest score anyone's ever scored yet. I'm sure you're going to do better on Wednesday um, on any of my exams. Usually, it's more like about 40. But the mean is usually around 20, 25, uh, et cetera. So, oops, back up here. Uh, so don't be too concerned when you're looking at the practice exam and you've missed like you have 12 questions. Uh, that means that probably seven or eight of those questions are bad and they're going to be normalized out anyway. So just as a hopefully um, to less stress you about the exam. So the other thing, as I've mentioned a number of times before, Monday's lecture is only going to be review and the material on the exam will just be the stuff that we cover through today's lecture. And if you ask lots of questions, we're not going to get very far. And if you don't ask very many, I'll talk real fast and we'll get through the whole thing. So <clears throat> last time we talked about mutations and that the mutation rate is actually very, very low, surprisingly low, considering how much replication actually has to take place. We also talked about semi-conservative replication and the most beautiful experiment in biology where Mieselson and Stahl showed that it was semi-conservative replication for at least the system that they were looking for. And everyone clear on how that worked? Because I told you last time that there will be a clicker question right at the beginning of class today. So, and I wouldn't want to break my promises, would I? So, <clears throat> We'll talk about that in just a second, but as a quick review, we're talking about mostly about mechanism today, how the DNA polymerase works, and then the actual mechanisms of the whole replication fork and the issues that it has to go with it. Another quick thing about this outline before we get to that clicker question, which I know you're all ready for now, that um, these are really great ways to review for exams. If you can go through each of these outlines and identify everything that's there, you're probably in pretty good shape. Okay, so. <clears throat> if replication were dispersive instead of semi-conservative, which is true for some DNA repair mechanisms, Mieslin and Stahl would expect to see how many bands after two generations of growth in light nucleotides. And then what Stedman loves to have for answers, because they're really easy to come up with lots of different ones, just numerical, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And again, please feel free to discuss this with your neighbors. It looks like we might want more time. Do we want to do another round? Yes, we can certainly do that. So I'll just start again. This first one won't count. OK, try again. <clears throat> 
15, 10, 5, So you guys are going to get me all to 100%, right? Not on this question. <laughs> so lots of differences of opinion on this one, which means I probably did a crummy job of explaining it towards the end of lecture last time. Uh, dispersive replication is bits and pieces of each of the strands of DNA which are getting copied separately. And if it's bits and pieces, you're going to have more and more of any individual bits and pieces, but never have a completely old strand and a completely new strand, which is what Measles and Stahl were separating from each other. So you're going to have a band which just slowly gets lighter and lighter and lighter. So it's just going to be one band. So the answer here is one band. So all these people high-fiving. I'm going to go and sit next to them for the next clicker question. <laughs> so is that clear? No, not. Huh. No, I'm happy to talk more about this. Uh, office hours actually will be my office today. It turns out that there is a class actually after this um, on Fridays. I was just misinformed as far as that was concerned. Yeah, in the back. Pardon, I didn't hear your question. OK, so the light nucleotides, the measles and install experiment, you grow E. coli in heavy nucleotides, actually heavy nitrogen and then you switch to light nitrogen. And so what happens is all the new DNA which is made is now light. And so the question is, do you get a whole strand of lights, so you have a hybrid molecule which is half and half, and then all lights as you go on after that, or in the case of a dispersive replication, as we'll see, which is what happens in DNA repair, it's bits and pieces, and those little bits and pieces, and since those bits and pieces are going to be random, that's going to be just more and more of a hybrid molecule as opposed to all new or new and old. Yeah, they're introduced for the first generation, second generation, it depends how many rounds of replication you've had at that point. Clearer, yes. OK, so the, the question here, and sorry, I'm going to paraphrase it here, is basically, how is the experiment done? As opposed to, you know, aren't you separating the heavies and the lights? No, all your, you're separating DNA that you have in your, in this case, E. coli. So you purify DNA, and you separate that DNA. If you've got multiple populations, some that are light and some that are heavy, those will separate from each other. If you don't, or you have some which is, in this case, 75% light and 25% heavy, all of your DNA is 75% light and 25% heavy. So that it's going to be one species of DNA that you have in the cell. If in semi-conservative replication, you have replication that takes place, you have half and half, that'll be one band, that's one spe species of DNA, and that's just all the DNA that you have inside the cell, and cell population. Then you'll also have some which are going to be just your light DNA. So you'll see a separate band for that. So there are going to be two different species of DNA in there. You'll have some which are half and half and semi-conservative, and some that are one and all light. You don't seem to be. <laughs> So um, what, I, what I'll do is I'll post a image. Somebody came to me in office hours on Wednesday, or actually yesterday, and was asking about this. Um, some nice block diagrams that hopefully will make it a little clearer. So I'll post that um, on D2L. OK, so what does this? Um, how do we get to this semi-conservative <coughs> replication process? What does the job? Oh, excuse me, let me hide this. No, not selecting the wrong answer. That would not be good. Try that. Uh, what does this? What does semi-conservative replication? So not surprisingly, DNA polymerase. Um, DNA polymerase needs 
basically three things in order to be able to take this you know, double-stranded DNA, semi-conservatively replicate it. It needs 2 prime deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates. So you have to have those high energy intermediates. You have to have a template. When I say template, that's the strand that's going to be copied. And one of the really weird things, at least as far as the discovery of these DNA polymerases, was that it always had to have what's called a primer, or a 3 prime OH that can be extended from. And of course, this immediately adds, brings us to the chicken and egg question. Well, OK, if it's only extending something that's already there, how do you get that first thing? We'll talk about that a little bit later on. So um, this was the work of Arthur Kornberg. Um, that's not as critical. I don't think I'll ask questions about Arthur Kornberg on the exam. I don't know. I haven't written it yet. Um, but the important thing here is that it was 1957 that he first described this enzyme. And how soon was that after Watson and Crick? When was Watson and Crick's paper? 53. So very, very, very quickly after Watson and Crick had come up with their structure, and it has not escaped our notice that uh, someone had come up, in fact, Roger, oh, sorry, Arthur Kornberg, Arthur and Roger, um, father and son, um, Nobel Prizes. People thought it was a big deal, but the Curies are way better because it's mother-daughter um, who are getting their Nobel Prizes. <clears throat> so this is what you need in order to get replication. You have to have triphosphates, a template, and a 3 prime OH in order to get this to happen. We now know that the structure of DNA polymerase looks kind of like a right hand, um, supposed to have a thumb, a palm, and fingers, and basically it grabs the DNA. And in that grabbing, and then right in the bottom of the palm is where the enzymatic activity is. That's where this polymerization activity takes place. What's the mechanism? We've talked about this already. You have a 3 prime OH, the nucleotide triphosphate that matches here. So this would be a C that's being added across from a G. Hydrolysis happens right here between what's called the alpha phosphate, alpha, beta, gamma phosphates on any triphosphate. This is where you have hydrolysis. This OH gets attached to this phosphate. A pyrophosphate, which is these two phosphates together, is released. And then you have a pyrophosphatase that will cleave these two. And so that all those coupled reactions now lead this to be a basically energetically irreversible reaction. And this is important because you don't want your DNA polymerase, it's just an enzyme, depolymerizing all of your DNA. So this is how you have that unidirectional reaction. How does the DNA polymerase do this. Again, talked about this hand structure with the thumb, fingers, and palm down here. Basically, it's grabbing the DNA. Why is it grabbing the DNA? What's well, grabbing the DNA to look for the shape of the DNA? It's not looking at the individual bases. And this is something that's really important. Because if you had a DNA polymerase, that was looking at every single base and said, hey, this is a G, this is a C, this is a T, this is an A, then that's going to be pretty inefficient. And also, it turns out, not going to be very high fidelity either, because it's really easy to have slight changes. And we'll talk about some of those slight changes when we talk about DNA repair um, a little bit later on. It's true for almost all enzymes, or not almost all enzymes, many, many enzymes, I should say. There are metals which are present in the active site of this enzyme for electron transfer reasons. These are those extra little elements in the periodic table. We talked about the periodic table for biology, mostly carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Those extra trace metals are mostly involved in these kinds of things. Also, why minerals are important in your diet. Because if you didn't have these minerals in your diet, you wouldn't be able to have DNA polymerases that work. So um, the last thing here, it has to do with the fact if you look at the DNA itself up here, there's kind of a bend that happens, particularly 
in the template strand. And what that does is basically sticks out the nucleotide which you're going to be attaching to. And that's important because of the what we call fidelity. Now fidelity is putting the right nucleotide, or I should say the correct nucleotide, opposite the one on the template which is the one that's supposed to be there. This is not, again, based on the identity of that nucleotide. It's based on the structure of the DNA. So you remember Watson and Crick, double helix, two nanometers apart, the glycosidic bonds are in the same place, the base pairs are nice and flat. That turns out to be how DNA polymerases seem to make sure that the right nucleotide is added. The right nucleotide is added because it makes the correct base pair. It's not because it's G is pairing with C. How does that happen? It happens due to an alpha helix right here in the DNA polymerase itself that basically flops down on top of the base pair once that base pair has been added. If it's flat, then we're good, we're happy, we've made a good base pair. If it's not, then the DNA polymerase waits and says, oh, okay, there's something wrong here. And it will take out that last nucleotide. And we'll see that here um, in just a second. This is the process called proofreading. So it's a structure specific. It's not a base specific enzyme here. And we'll see the same thing is true for the DNA polymerases as well. So if we have a wrong base pair, say a GG base pair for instance, then the DNA structure is wrong. What happens is that at that point there's a exonuclease activity. So we haven't talked too much about exos and endos yet. But the basic idea of exo and endonuclease is exo, of course, is coming in from the outside. Endo is being here in the inside. So if you look at a DNA molecule, exonucleases are going to chew in at ends. Endonucleases are going to chew here in the middle of your DNA molecule. So proofreading is an exonuclease. It takes off that last nucleotide that was added. Oh, one thing emphasize here, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about 5' prime and 3'. Prime. Because these DNA polymerases are always adding to 3' prime ends, the polymerase is going to be polymerizing from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So polymerization is always from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Again, remember the ribose structure with the 5' prime and the 3' prime on it. So polymerization is going from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. This exonuclease activity is the wrong base. It's going to be then going back in the opposite direction. So this is now a what? It's up here. 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease. So that 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease will chew off the last nucleotide. Once that last nucleotide has been chewed off, now you have a OH at the 3 prime end. So here's the description. Here we have our primer, our template, our triphosphates. The wrong nucleotide is added. This structure is incorrect. That nucleotide gets taken out with this 3' to 5' exonuclease activity. Now we have an OH. Now we can continue our replication because this looks down here exactly like it looks like up here. So it's really easy to continue your replication process. And one important thing here is that this only works with 5' prime to 3' prime polymerization. Huh? Well, who cares? Well, if you remember, strands are always anti-parallel to each other. So this should immediately raise a problem in terms of thinking about replicating the strands. We'll get back to this in just a second. Uh, this is, we've basically talked about this already, two activities of the DNA polymerase. There's polymerization and exonuclease. It turns out this is a separate domain, as I mentioned on the last slide, but, well, it was on the last slide, but I didn't mention it. Uh, you can actually cut off this domain and have a polymerase that does not have this proofreading exonuclease activity. It turns out to be an incredibly useful tool for molecular biology purposes. So why doesn't 
the polymerization in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction work? Well, basically, it's because if you remember our nucleotide triphosphates, where is that triphosphate? It's on the 5 prime part of your ribose. So always 5 prime triphosphates. So with our 5 prime triphosphates, this is the way it normally happens. You know, 5 prime to 3 prime growth. Each time you add a nucleotide, you have a 3 prime OH. It's really easy to continue here. In theory, this would be the opposite kind of polymerization. 3 prime to 5 prime, you have your nucleotide triphosphate, gets added to the end. You're going to cleave off these two phosphates, pyrophosphatase, et cetera, et cetera. This would be fine unless you have proofreading and take off the wrong nucleotide. If you take off the wrong nucleotide, now you're going to have a 5 prime phosphate here, not a 5 prime triphosphate as you had up here. And now, energetically, it's not going to work. So in order to have proofreading, you have to polymerize from 5 prime to 3 prime. And interestingly enough, yes, Arthur Kornberg got his Nobel Prize. Um, Roger Kornberg later got his Nobel Prize. Um, he was apparently pushing his students all the time. You know, why? You've got to find this other polymerase. Why don't we have a 3 prime to 5 prime polymerase? We have to have a 3 prime to 5 prime polymerase. So he kept doing this and um, apparently burned out rather a number of students in the process. Eventually, other people figured out what was going on here. So we talked about this. Fidelity, the first process of fidelity, is just checking the base pair, checking the structure of DNA as it's being replicated. That means that the polymerase itself ends up making a mistake between 1 in 10,000, 1 in 100,000 bases, which is really pretty good if you think about how these polymerases are working. And we haven't talked about it yet, but it turns out that these polymerases are going thousands of nucleotides a second. So really pretty amazing how few mistakes they end up making. If they do make a mistake, and that you know, base pair ends up being a base pair and then being incorrect, the proofreading will take out 99 of 100 of those mistakes. Still, however, that doesn't get us to our 1 in a billion, and this is actually the 1 in 10 billion here, uh, overall mutation rate after polymerization. That last one is something called strand-directed mismatch repair that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And the numbers here, you will notice, don't add up to what I had on my last slide, the well, last lecture, I should say, where it was 1 in a billion, here is 1 in 10 billion. You can argue about the exact numbers of any of these. So if I were to ask you a question, I would, tr on an exam, say, next Wednesday, um, I would try and give it a range, and that range should be the correct one. OK, so <clears throat> let's go back a little bit and talk about this problem of not having a polymerase which polymerizes from 3 prime to 5 prime, rather than 5 prime to 3 prime. Uh, and so this comes about because, again, as Watson and Crick showed very nicely in their model, and we now know that DNA is always going to be anti-parallel. Two anti-parallel strands, which means that one strand is 5 prime to 3 prime, the other one is 3 prime to 5 prime. And how do you do replication? You pull the two strands apart and you replicate each of those strands. That was actually seen quite nicely in some really amazing electron micrograph images. These are really hard to make, by the way, uh, where you have a replicating circular DNA where this is your replication fork. This is where replication is taking place. And if you've got a circular DNA, it turns out that these replication forks go in opposite directions relative to each other. So the question is, what's happening at one of these replication forks? Again, you've got a double-stranded DNA, 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime, 3 prime, opposite strands relative to each other, and nobody could find, even though those, like those very hard-working Kornberg graduate students um, who were trying to find that polymerase, they couldn't find one. And the only polymerases, when, again, theoretically people looked at it and said, no, it's not going to work any other way. So what's going on here? And there were a couple of experiments where people looked at the DNA which is being made right here as DNA replication is taking place. 
And Seiji Okazaki, uh, <coughs> Japanese researcher who may or may not have gotten cancer from the atomic bomb um, landing on Nagasaki, uh, he and his wife, actually, um, working together on this, showed that there were lots of short pieces of DNA whenever you looked at replicating cells. And why would you have all these short pieces of DNA? Five prime to three prime replication should be happening. And as we said, you know, very few mistakes, a little bit of exonuclease activity. That should be giving you really big pieces of DNA. Why should you have all these little small pieces of DNA? And it turns out that they actually thought that both strands were being made as small pieces of DNA. But if you had this retrograde or backwards kind of replication happening on the opposite direction at an individual replication fork, then you could have a DNA polymerase that would work also from 5' prime to 3', prime, but you're going to be making lots of little tiny pieces. And these pieces have since been called Okazaki fragments, again, in honor of the Okazakis. Uh, turns out that they're different sizes in bacteria and in eukaryotic cells. They're much longer in bacteria. Fortunately, they were working in bacteria, so they're easier to detect. The really short ones are harder to find. And that may actually have to do with the fact that eukaryotic DNA is packaged in what? Nucleosomes. How big is a nucleosome in terms of the DNA it protects? About 150 nucleotides, not dissimilar to the size of these Okazaki fragments. So, and this is these are approximate numbers here. So, <clears throat> given that, let's actually I'll back up here a little briefly. Um, so, <clears throat> there's also what, in fact, Okazaki's came up with in their original paper, which I think I've posted on D2L. Um, they had, again, just like measles and install had, different models for how DNA was being replicated. So continuous replication, which would be having a polymerase that is replicating both strands. And again, forgot to mention this here, my leading and lagging strands. Obviously, I'm not reading my slides properly here. Your leading strand is this one right here, where you have one polymerase which can continually polymerize and make one long piece of DNA. The lagging strand are all of these shorter pieces which are being made. So one long, one short. So this was called, again, by the Okazakis, um, had a couple of different models. There was either continuous replication, which would be both strands being replicated at the same time by long pieces. You could have discontinuous replication, which is a little like the dispersive idea that we had for our clicker question earlier, which is little pieces being made, and actually little pieces being made on both strands. And it turns out that's what the Okazaki's first thought was the case. Or you can have semi-discontinuous. You know, this whole semi-business is getting a little crazy. Semi-discontinuous is one strand is being made continuously. That would be the leading strand. And the other one is being made discontinuously. So what kind of replication do we have? And that's what the clicker question is finally supposed to be. So cellular DNA replication is continuous and semi-conservative, semi-discontinuous and semi-conservative, discontinuous and semi-conservative, continuous and conservative, semi-discontinuous and conservative. Huh? It's hard to say all these things. And five. Much more of a consensus now. Yay. So semi-semi. That's all you need to remember. Semi-semi. Um, 
semi-discontinuous because of those extra pieces on one strand, and <coughs> semi-conservative because one strand is old and one strand is new. So yes, um, B is the correct answer here. OK, what's the next problem that we have? So this semi-discontinuous, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So when we have the uh, nuclear tie going and attaching to the free prime, mm -hmm. and it, it breaks that phosphate bond and it attaches, how come when, you, when the proof reader comes, it can pull that off and that phosphate isn't still on that free prime, but it does remain on the five prime? Oh, so I guess the question here has to do with where the hydrolysis is actually taking place when you have proofreading, um, and also when you have polymerization. So it's always between the alpha and beta phosphates. Remember, it's a triphosphate, alpha, beta, gamma, going away from the ribose. So alpha is the first one, beta is the second one, um, and gamma is the third one. So it's that alpha phosphate. The alpha phosphate is then the one that gets attached to the 3'OH. That's also where hydrolysis takes place, it's that same bond. That make more sense? Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> okay, so proofreading and this semi-discontinuous nature, great, fine, wonderful. That takes care of the fact that we don't have a different polymerase, again, for these proofreading reasons. The next problem is DNA polymerases need what? They need primers as well as templates. Where does that primer come from? Where do you get that OH that the DNA polymerase can extend from in the first place? So what you need is DNA primase, horrible name, because DNA primase is actually an RNA polymerase. So DNA primase puts RNA onto DNA. And we'll talk more about this later when we talk about making messenger RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, etc. RNA polymerases are very different from DNA polymerases in that they can start. They don't need primers. They can just put nucleotide triphosphates into these base pairing interactions and start. So the DNA primase is an RNA polymerase. RNA polymerases are great. Why don't we just use RNA polymerases for everything? Why don't bother with these crazy DNA polymerases? Uh, the main reason seems to be that most RNA polymerases are not as high fidelity that base pairing interaction, that alpha helix that flops down and makes sure the structure is as good, is nowhere near as good for RNA polymerases as it is for DNA polymerases. So relatively low fidelity, often the wrong nucleotide gets put in. We'll see how that gets taken care of um, a little bit later on. But of course, once you have a 3 prime OH, it doesn't matter if it's DNA or RNA, as long as it's base paired and base paired in the right place, then you can have a DNA polymerase that can come in and extend these primers. And the extension of those primers, in the case of an Okazaki fragment, is going to bring you to the next primer, right? Because each of these is being made in the semi-discontinuous fashion. This is the discontinuous part on the lagging strand. So your primer is made, 3 prime OH is made, DNA polymerase gets to this other primer. OK, now what do you do? Well, you need to got a couple of problems here. One is there's a gap in your DNA. And the second one is that this RNA polymerase is pretty low fidelity. So it's adding in the wrong nucleotides quite often. So you want to get rid of that RNA. How do you get rid of that RNA? Turns out there are a couple of different ways of doing that that cells use. Again, sorry to over-anthropomorphize here. One of them is RNase H. RNase H is an RNase. Most enzymes aces. What does it do? It chops up RNA. RNase H chops up RNA specifically in RNA DNA hybrids. So if you have a hybrid of RNA and DNA, RNase H will chew that off. Also, it turns out, DNA polymerase 1 has an activity that can also get rid of RNAs. Now, mentioned DNA polymerase 1, we talked about Roger Kornberg, um, has this wonderful activity, extends OHs needs a template, et cetera, has very high fidelity, has proofreading activity, but it also has one very strange thing. And that is this polymerase also has a 
five prime to three prime exonuclease activity. It's like, whoa, okay, doesn't it polymerize from five prime to three prime? If it's got a five prime to three prime exonuclease activity, then it's going to be chewing up whatever DNA it runs into. So it's actually going to chew up the ends here. So it turns out that DNA polymerase one has this very specific activity which can chew up the RNA until it gets to the end of the DNA here. Turns out it can chew up DNA as well, but that's a different story. As far as we're concerned, it's just chewing up the primer. Then you end up with this gap here, and the gap here is literally, it's the nucleotide that you've added, and now there's a five prime end that that three prime end needs to be added to. That's DNA ligase, which at, will put together, ligate as we call it, five prime phosphates and three prime OHs. So to get one of these Okazaki fragments, you need RNA primase, sorry, DNA primase, it's an RNA polymerase, um, DNA polymerase, RNase H, and DNA ligase. Again, how do you get rid of these primers? RNase H is one of them. And then DNA polymerase 1 has this really bizarre activity. The um, 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease and 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease, both. Proofreading activity and activity that will chew this away. This was also one of the things that Arthur Kornberg was bugging his graduate students about. He said, this can't be true that we have a 5 prime to 3 prime and a 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease in this DNA polymerase. It makes no sense to do this. And we'll see why a little bit later on. Yeah? What's the clarification? I thought you made remarks that the RNA would require primer. So why is there an RNA primer that goes into the DNA that has to get transmitted? Okay, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Let's go here or the, the previous one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So the first step, the first step is down here. So if you just have a template with no primer, you have to start somehow making the primers the DNA primase. So that makes the RNA. So after you're done down here, that's the step that we go back up to over here. Does that maybe make more sense? But you don't want to have that RNA around anymore because of the low fidelity of that RNA polymerase, putting in the wrong things. And so it's a fidelity mechanism, which is getting rid of that RNA. Turns out there are actually quite a few RNAs left in our replicated genome. Totally cool story, but we're not, as far as we're concerned, they don't exist. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's so I'll just you know, repeat it here. But yes, you are right with one small exception to that. Um, that is that, okay, the RNA primase makes the primer. And again, I think it's maybe easier to look at here. Um, now you have, once you have the primer which has been made, then the DNA polymerase will finish off this end here. So either extend this primer, it's a primer that was over here, which we'll get to here. Then this piece of RNA needs to get removed. There are two ways that that can happen. There's the DNA polymerase 1 that, if it's extending right here, it's got this 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease, so both 3 prime to 5 prime and 5 prime to 3 prime, I should have added that here, um, which will chew this up and get rid of it. But you're always going to have a gap, like you have right down here at the bottom, which you'll need a DNA ligase for. So you can use DNA polymerase 1. You can also use RNase H to get rid of that DNA-RNA hybrid. And it turns out that there's basically these redundant mechanisms for you able to do that. No, but you always need the DNA ligase. So, okay, now we've made, oh, sorry, in the back. Yeah. So the question is, is it only working when it has to remove that primer? The answer is no. It actually can work in lots of different places. So it's not just removing the primer, which you should immediately think to yourself, wait a minute, this is like totally counterproductive if you're chewing up DNA in front of the polymerase and laying it down after the polymerase. We'll get back to that in just a second. Okay, so 
We've got our primers. We got the OHs. What else do we need? Nucleotide triphosphates. You need a template. How do you get a template? Template is single stranded DNA. What's DNA look like most of the time? Double stranded. How do you get single stranded DNA? Helicase. So it's the double helix. Aces, what do they do? They break things, breaking the helix, pulling those two strands apart. Turns out that pulling strands apart is hard. We saw that before when we looked at just DNA denaturation heating up. You've got to get pretty hot to get these two strands to come apart. But the cell, you don't want to heat up your cell. So how do you get the two strands to come apart? This is where the DNA helicases come along. These DNA helicases will wrap around one strand of DNA. You can see a nice image down here at the bottom. This is actually from an X-ray crystal structure of a DNA helicase, which wraps around a single strand of DNA and then burns very large amounts of ATP. And in fact, in, in replication, one of the main ATP hydrolyzing enzymes is this helicase, because it requires lots of energy to pull those strands apart. And pulling those strands apart, again, is, is energetically <clears throat> a very inefficient process. You need lots of ATP. So now we've got template from the helicase. We've got primers from the primase. And then we need to get rid of those <clears throat> primers, again, through RNAsH and the rest of the process. So again, this is lots of ATP, which is required in this process. Now we have two strands that have come apart. What's the problem with single-stranded DNA? Just a sec. What's the problem with single-stranded DNA? What does it like to do? Boom. Bind back to itself. Is that useful if you're trying to do polymerization? No. So you have to have a way of keeping those single strands apart. And then we have the incredibly creatively named single-stranded binding protein. So SSB, which binds to single-stranded DNA. And basically what it does is stops it from coming back together. Your question. How did it get into the single strand if it's double stranded in the first place? It's a great question, and we're probably not going to get to it this time. It has to do with origins of replication. But we'll, we'll talk about that and, and loader complexes. But yeah, we'll probably not get to that today. <laughs> Rem remember that question, and we'll talk about it after the exam. OK, so these single stranded DNA binding proteins, again, main thing that they do, bind to those strands after the DNA helicases pulled them apart so that the polymerase can do its wonderful job. Or if you're talking about the lagging strand, you also have to have the DNA primase, which is going to be able to come into the replication fork and do that. One other thing I wanted to mention here is the binding of this SSB is a highly cooperative process. What the heck do I mean by cooperative? So what I mean by cooperative is that basically, once you have binding of one protein, that leads to binding of lots and lots of other proteins very rapidly thereafter. So it's kind of like the positive feedback loops that we've talked about before in terms of chromatin modification. Binding of one protein leads to binding of lots of proteins um, right after that. So it's that first step um, where you have <clears throat> DNA binding. And this happens actually quite rapidly. So as soon as those two strands come apart, single-stranded DNA binding protein will bind to it. This means that you have to have a lot of single-stranded DNA binding proteins in your cells all the time when you're going to do replication. Because as soon as those strands come apart, you've got to have a single-stranded DNA binding protein to be there. So it turns out single-stranded DNA binding proteins are some of the most common proteins inside of cells. So now hopefully, oh, the one more other thing. This has to do with your question at the back about DNA polymerase 1. So if DNA polymerase 1 has 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity, presumably it could chew up just as much DNA as it's just already made, unless it's not processive. Now, what do I mean again by processivity? Processivity means once you start doing something, you keep doing something. And in this case, it's polymerization. So processivity is going to be, once you start polymerizing here, 3 prime OH will continue to make more and more nucleotides, continue, et cetera. 
This would be a processive polymerase. A non-processive polymerase will put on a couple of bases and then fall off the DNA. Put on a couple of bases, fall off the DNA. Turns out that all DNA polymerases are non-processive. And that's really good if it's DNA polymerase 1 that has this extra exonuclease activity. Because if it keeps falling off, then it's not going to chew up all of the DNA that's made. But you still, of course, have to have these some processive DNA polymerases, which will be able to replicate your whole genome. So that's where we get to the point it's not just DNA polymerase 1. That's why we call it DNA polymerase 1. In E. coli, it's DNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. And then it turns out that the only reasons they're called 1, 2, and 3 is because that was the order they were discovered in. DNA polymerase 1, DNA polymerase 2, and DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is very different from DNA polymerase 1 in one very particular way. And that is that it interacts with, through protein-protein interactions, with this thing called the sliding clamp. Okay, what the heck is a sliding clamp? Sliding clamp is basically a ring around the DNA. Not in your bathtub, this is the ring around your DNA. So the ring around the DNA, if you've got a ring of a protein around a DNA, that's not going to come off. Your hand, you know, bind to fall off all the time. As I said, that's what happens to DNA polymerases. But if you have a ring around the DNA, and then an interaction with that ring, say the hand is now stuck to the ring on your DNA, that DNA polymerase is now going to be very processive because it can't fall off and then have to rebind to the DNA every time. So the big difference between DNA polymerase 1 and DNA polymerase 3 is that DNA polymerase 3 binds to this sliding clamp, and DNA polymerase 1 does not. And that means that DNA polymerase 3 is processive, DNA polymerase 1 is not processive. So this processivity factor turns out all DNA polymerases have this effect. They're not very processive. If you have <clears throat> to have replication, you have to have one of these processivity factors. Uh, a lot of people also talk about these processivity factors as kind of being the, the tool belt of replication. Turns out that these processivity factors interact with all kinds of different things, and not just the DNA polymerases. So here is our sliding clamp. It's called beta, unfortunately, really horrible name in E. coli. Um, PCNA, yet another horrible name that you find in eukaryotic cells. This is the proliferating cell nuclear antigen. What a silly name. Um, but if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because in a proliferating cell, what does that mean? It's undergoing replication all the time. Lots of replication needs lots of these sliding clamps to hold your processive DNA polymerase onto the DNA. Particularly true for lagging strands. We talked about Okazaki fragments. Okazaki fragments in eukaryotic cells are really short, like hundreds of nucleotides. So 100 nucleotides, and they're going to be making a new piece, making a new piece, making a new piece. And the PCNA, the sliding clamp, has got to be there for each one of those individual pieces. So it's one of the proteins, together with that single-stranded DNA binding protein, that's present at very high levels um, inside of replicating cells. So proliferating cell nuclear antigen, PCNA, serves the same purpose as the beta sliding clamp. And then, of course, viruses are the coolest thing ever. So I had to have a viral one in the middle. Turns out that's a very similar kind of structure here. So it's a ring around the DNA, again, holding things on. Very similar to our organisms. But how do you get this ring around the DNA? How does it happen in the first place? Well, to do that, you need, again, the creatively named clamp loader complex. So you have this partial ring structure, which then has to close in on the DNA to order to make these structures. This requires ATP hydrolysis, basically because you're holding this ring apart until you get it onto the DNA. Getting it onto the DNA, ATP hydrolysis happens, and the clamp will close on your double-stranded DNA. Once it's closed on the double-stranded DNA, now you can have interactions with the DNA polymerase. You have a processive DNA polymerase. But to get that, you've got to put this 
clamp onto the DNA right where you have this primer. So let's look at another view of this. Here's that sliding clamp. Here's the sliding clamp here in purple. The DNA polymerase will replicate until it gets to this primer. If it's DNA polymerase 1, it's not going to be bound to the sliding clamp, so it'll never actually see this. DNA polymerase 1 might get to here when you have this polymerase hits this right here. And DNA polymerase 3, that's the main replicate polymerase that interacts here, it can't do anything with primers. It's going to fall off once it hits one of these primers. Then you can have RNase H that will cleave this off, or DNA polymerase 1 can come in and get rid of this primer. So you've got, again, two ways of getting rid of these particular primers. We'll see a little bit later, again, probably not today, uh, that in eukaryotes there's no DNA polymerase 1. It's got a slightly different mechanism for doing this. So sliding clamp, hold on to the polymerase until it gets to a new primer. Um, and as you can see at the bottom here, you'll notice there's still that PCNA, the primer, at each of these primer junctions, you'll have one of these sliding clamps that's left. So any kind of primer junction, again, particularly in lagging strands, you're going to have lots of these sliding clamps that are associated with it. OK, finish up. One more clicker here, and then we'll look at the replication forks. I promise it'll be the last clicker today. Which of the following does not require ATP for its activity? DNA helicase, clamp loader, sliding clamp, DNA primase, or, you know, step when we can't think of anything else, lead, you know, D and E. C and D, sorry. Ten. Four. OK, let's look at our results. OK, we can't make up our mind whether DNA primase should be part of it or not. That seems to be take home here, right? So what is DNA primase? It's an RNA polymerase. Right? What is ATP? Adenosine triphosphate. Ribo is adenosine triphosphate. What happens if you have a T in your DNA that you need to add a RNA to make a primer with? What do you need? ATP. So the DNA primase does need ATP. Which leaves us with C. So the, clamp, the sliding clamp, once it's on the DNA, does not need any more um, ATPase <coughs> activity. OK, finish up now just looking at the replication fork. What's actually present at a replication fork? This is basically a review of what we've talked about so far as far as replication is concerned. Got our leading strand here, leading strand polymerase, sliding clamp. And this is now our DNA polymerase. This is DNA polymerase 3 in E. coli, which is going to be replicating along. It'll be doing its thing. It can only do so if you have your single-stranded DNA. So you need a DNA helicase. This is easy for the leading strand. Lagging strand is a lot more complicated. You have DNA helicase, which will be separating the two strands. It takes a while for each of these Okazaki fragments to be made. So you have this piece of single-stranded DNA hanging out here that has to have this single-stranded DNA binding protein associated with it. Single-stranded DNA binding protein, now you have your DNA primase that will put down a small piece of RNA that will give you the OH that this polymerase could extend. 
It also has to have the sliding clamp loaded so that this polymerase can be processive. So you have a clamp loader here. So at the replication fork, you have the DNA helicase, your primase, your clamp loader, your clamp, single-stranded DNA binding protein, and the DNA polymerases. One of the <clears throat> questions that came up rather soon when people were thinking about this is, what about that lagging strand polymerase? So is the lagging strand polymerase associated with the leading strand polymerase, or is it just flopping in from the cell every time that you need a new primer? It's a really inefficient process to be bringing in a new polymerase every single time. So we now know that those polymerases are actually associated with each other. The leading strand polymerase and the lagging strand polymerase are part of one complex that comes together. And this is just another view of looking at that um, right here. So I just wanted to finish by showing you the, one of my favorite videos. Um, this is the DNA replication video, <clears throat> which will show up here on the wrong screen. So I've got to move it over. Yes, aren't they cute? I think so anyway. Uh, <laughs> So this is, again, you've probably seen this video before. If we can actually get it to load, that would be nice. Uh, looking at, this is <clears throat> the part we've seen already. This is the packaging of the DNA. Here we should have DNA replication. OK, so here's that replication fork. Let me blow this up. So here's our DNA going through the helicase, two strands getting separated. Here's the leading strand polymerase with the sliding clamp, which is replicating here. Every time you get to the end of an Okazaki fragment, you're going to be putting this lagging strand polymerase onto the DNA. And to do that, you also need the sliding clamp. So the sliding clamp is here in <coughs> green. That sliding clamp stays with that lagging strand. The polymerases here are the purple bits. The, the clamp loader is the white piece, unfortunately a bit hard to see right here in the middle. Uh, what's missing in here? Single-stranded binding protein is missing. And we'll see a couple of other things that are missing um, a little bit later on. It's worth uh, looking at this video a couple of times, um, I think, to go through and, and follow everything which is going on there. There's a, the link is here. Let's go back to Last thing to talk about today is what's going on at that replication fork. We already talked about the bacterial proteins that are involved, DNA polymerase 3, primase, helicase, single strand binding protein, the sliding clamp, and the clamp loader. Unfortunately, in eukaryotes, they came up with different names for all of these things. Um, and we'll look at these after the midterm. Um, in eukaryotes, it's DNA polymerase delta, maybe epsilon as well, that's involved in that replicative polymerase. DNA primase is very confusingly also associated with DNA polymerase alpha. So in eukaryotic cells, you've got a short primer which is made by the primase, and then DNA polymerase alpha will extend that a little bit. Then DNA polymerase alpha actually will fall off of the DNA, and that gets extended by the replicative polymerase, DNA polymerase delta and DNA polymerase epsilon. The helicase, I have a question mark here. It's called MCM. MCM. What the heck does MCM stand for? Uh, alphabet soup is another name for this class. Um, mini chromosome maintenance um, was found originally in yeast, and all these yeast geneticists like to name things <coughs> excuse me, after the phenotype of the mutant. So if you get rid of MCM, you can't maintain chromosomes. Makes sense? It's that helicase. Turns out that people were wondering whether that was the case for a long time. Um, now it's pretty clearly the case that it's the helicase, the replicative helicase. RPA is a DNA, single-stranded DNA binding protein. PCNA, 
we already talked about. That's the sliding clamp, the proliferating cell nuclear antigen, and RFC. Oh, I got not another one. Um, the replication factor C. It's the clamp loader complex. So uh, this, one of the reasons I wanted to mention this before we call it quits for the day and go out in that nice rainy weather um, is that you'll see this often um, in the literature, but it's also a good way to review thinking about replication, replication forks, et cetera. What do all of these things do? And what's their role in replication? So with that um, review on Monday, midterm on Wednesday, um, people have more questions. You can ask me now for the next five, 10 minutes. Send me email. Um, also can discuss things on D2L.